Hey, Bastish B here for 64K and welcome to another special episode of Top 10s. Top 20 Commodore 64 Modern Era Games from 2011 to 2021. So, as you can see, this is another special celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Commodore 64. This one is celebrating the modern era. These are my favorite games from this era from 2011 right up to 2021. And it goes without saying that this is just my list, these are just my personal favorites, whatever yours are are way more important than this list. You can think of this list as just a guide for the community. If you're new to the Commodore 64 scene and you want to see what the modern era has to give you, then this is a great guide. And if you're getting back into the C64 after many years of hiatus or something like that, then you can look at this and find a whole lot of new games to play. And with this video being part of a special 40th anniversary celebration, there is way more games covered here than 20, so please keep watching. And with all that said and done, let's start this countdown. Number 20. In late 2020, we got Neptune Lander Elite on the Commodore 64 by C64 Mark. This is essentially another clone game, but it goes way more than that by taking the basic gameplay and adding lots of fun addictiveness to the overall experience. Number one is definitely music. I love a game with a good thumping soundtrack. A C64 game especially just feels kind of weird without one, and this game has some rocking tracks. All the basic tropes are in place though. Choose where to land out of three options. If successful, however, you move on to the next level with 40 uniquely designed stages in total to try out and beat. I really like all the fun little additions like the laser guns, massive moving doors, those dodgy EMP traps and various others that make this much more challenging. The stages themselves are also designed extremely well and are not merely randomly generated, like the original Lunar Lander. Difficulty settings are also available if you find it a bit hard and the cracking group access has a nice trend version if you really bad at it. The best part though is that the game is free or pay what you want so why not give them a couple of bucks for this cool little game. It is however only PAL compatible in case you're thinking of playing it on original hardware so just bear that in mind. The excellent graphics, the really nice variety to the stages, optional music or sound effects in game, great controls which again I'd highly recommend keyboard over controller for this game for the best experience and this all amounts to another excellent clone game which goes beyond the original and is one of the most fun recent C64 games I've played. Check it out. Number 19 Run and Gun was released at the beginning of 2021 by Below the Tower on the Commodore 64. It's another in a long line of excellent new C64 games to grace the good old Commodore in the last decade. The game is an action platform puzzle game that takes all those elements and successfully combines them for a damn good time. I got to speak with programmer and designer of the game Carlton Handley. Hi, I'm Carlton Handley. I've been a software developer for over 30 years. I started off coding for the 64 and have recently been bitten by the Commodore bug again. Coded a few modern games for our 8-bit computer, including Millie and Molly and Good Picks. And asked him if there was any particular older game that inspired Run and Gun. The main inspiration came from some mock-up graphics Sal sent me while we were completing Millie and Molly. He wanted to know whether it would be interested in developing something off the back of them. They look great, so I was definitely in. I don't think there's any one game which is in front of the direction the game has gone though. Just stuff I've played in the past. The Mario is probably the main inspiration, but there's also bits of Metro, Metal Slug and Contra. The story goes that two main characters, Run and Gun, get fused together in a military experiment and gone awry. Now, as a player, you can switch between them on the fly, each with their own strengths and weaknesses, as you try to stop an alien threat on the planet Bangtaya. Switching between these characters is key to success. Run is fast and can double jump but has a limited weapon range and gun is slower with no double jump but his guns more powerful and shoots further. It's a mechanic used to great effect in Colton's previous game Millie and Molly although in a different gameplay style. I asked Colton if the two main character switch mechanic is something he loves seeing in games as I feel it definitely makes gameplay more interesting. It's just a happy coincidence that there are two characters in both of the games. Solid originally preferred the second 
attacking character as someone for the player to escort and it was never her intention for them to be controlled. It eventually transformed into the switch mechanic which I think is both more interesting and was actually easier to program. The game requires fast reflexes and nerves of steel if you want to make it all the way. Dying puts you close to where your death point was and you also get a bunch of continues so even though it is tough it's generous without making you suffer. Knowing who to use when is the biggest key to getting far. I asked Carlton how he came to collaborate with Soul Cross who does the graphics and music on this game. I'd already worked with Soul on Millie Molly. That came about after I posted on Lemon asking for people to work on the new 64 game. So I responded and we went from there. Guy in the switch rolls for running gun when he sent me that map and he needed a programmer. We ended up working together again. As you can see the graphics are really good giving a cool NES style platformer look that looks pretty unique on the C64. The music is also another winner with Soul providing some pumping tunes on this one. Sounding a lot like his soundtrack for Alien 8 but that's a good thing. Once you start figuring out each section the game becomes easier and easier and veterans may find it a little short overall although I enjoyed my time with it a lot. I asked Carlton if there are any plans to add maybe new levels or scenarios to the game later. The plan was always to release a slightly smaller game as one mission and part of a planned trilogy but I don't think I've made this clear. I still think there's a decent amount of content even in this one mission that I didn't want to spend a lot of time coding something that people may not like and the sooner people played it and fed back the better. This feedback can then be used to help improve the game going forward and it's already helping me in the design of mission 2. And finally I hope that each mission would sell enough to fund development for the next one. It takes a lot of time to develop and produce something like Run and Go that I'm currently working full time on it. So as you can probably guess support from the 64 community is essential. It's something that has been excellent and I thank everyone that has taken interest. The gameplay works well. There's a lot of platforming and shooting with quick reflexes required in the later areas. It reminded me a little bit of Super Meat Boy but no way near as annoying. You can see Carlton's skills as a level designer as each section is very cleverly put together and work well as a whole. Another feature I like is the controls are changeable. I didn't really like the standard setup and changed it to the up is jump and fire is fire method. Of course this is just my personal preference but definitely try it out first to see what works for you. And the game also features full keyboard controls and is NTSC and PAL compatible. I asked Carlton one last question that being if he has any plans for his next game yet. Sol and I are planning on completing missions 2 and 3 over the next couple of months. I'd then really like to do something like the Game Boy Zelda game Link's Awakening. Obviously this is a huge undertaking but Sol already has some graphics he's mocked up and he's thinking of something similar. And that's Run and Gun, a fast paced shooting puzzle platform game that I thoroughly enjoyed. Check the video description for a link to purchase the game and happy platforming. Number 18 Soulless 2 The Armor of Gods was released in August 2021 on the Commodore 64 by Cytronic Software. It is a sequel to Soulless originally released in 2012 and that game also recently received a special edition version which is totally worth checking out. Soulless 2 picks up story wise as you, King Razak, sets out to find the legendary Armor of the Gods which gives you the ability to fly and use the weapon of the sun. He sets out to find it before it falls into the hands of the demented wizard Kaelin. I was lucky enough to interview Trevor Story from Archon64 who did the art and game concept for Solus 2. My first question was pretty broad with the original Solus coming out almost a decade ago now. How much does he think the C64 retro scene has changed in that time? And Trevor said there are definitely more development teams and a lot more publishers of 8-bit C64 stuff now. We also have a few dedicated C64 retro magazines with Fusion, Free64, Zap64, Italian Zap, Reset64 just to name a few. Also with the release of the C64 and the C64 Mini a lot more people have returned to the C64 so the scene has grown quite a lot which is great for us all. The game like Sacred Armor of Anteria the inspiration for this game is a combination of exploration, puzzle solving and a whole lot of action and combines them excellently for its four massive levels. You start off with mapping and have to find a gun for defense and once you gain the armor you need to upgrade the suit with guns and you also now gain the ability to fly and jump in and out of the suit to solve various puzzles and destroy enemies. My second question for Trevor was if he was a fan of the original Antiriad back in the day and he said Antiriad was a firm favorite for me and my mates when it came out. The artwork by Dan Malone was killer and
and the awesome title music by Richard Joseph brings back great memories. It was fantastic, if short release. Each of the levels you go through has their own look and style, and also focus on a different part of the gameplay element. Level 1 is all about solving puzzles. Level 2 is exploration and discovery of the suit. Level 3 is all about big enemies to fight, etc etc. It's done really well and even though you're doing a bit of everything in all the levels, they still have their own identity. Gameplay is a great mix. Simple puzzle solving like matching colors with statues to open paths to get keys. Action is really fun and fast whether it's with your gun or with the suit weapon. It's very satisfying blowing away everything and the exploration element is great. The game does come with a map if you're easily lost but I found I didn't really need it as the levels tended to be pretty logically set out. I also asked Trevor with the size of the game being pretty large I asked him how long the team had been working on this game for and he said Jorg originally wanted to do a metroidvania style game so I designed Hyperium which was pretty large. Sadly this turned into a real slog and slowly we lost interest in the project but I really wanted to do something along the lines so I simplified the design and brought it back to flip screen then it turned into Soulless 2 and the idea to include the armor came about. We started in 2015 and finished in 2021 with a lot of gaps in development while we did other stuff. We still managed to cram a lot into the game and it only just fit on one side of a disc. There are also plenty of secret rooms to discover that have enemies to kill who drop crowns. These crowns give you extra lives and are well worth seeking out. The Archon 64 team really delivered on this one yet again with Jorg Rottensteiner on programming, Trevor on art and concept and Soulcross on music and sound effects. My final question I asked Trevor was how difficult was it setting up the level design as you had to get the combination of flying and walking right since most levels incorporate them and he said I really wanted each level to feel a bit different from the last. So the first level was designed as an on foot level where you gain access to a weapon. The second level would be where you find the armor and can fly around and land. The third would have an interactive background pieces which acted as enemies and the fourth would have lots of mini bosses to fight. Final boss was made a separate load so we'd make it a more interesting battle with a nice bitmap background. The room design changed as we tested so you could mostly get around on foot. The only thing we had to really think about was the amount of sprites on screen as you could exit your armor suit so we had to come up with the ways to get around the sprite limit. We also added a few rooms in the second third and fourth levels that would randomize on each play. We had to lose the idea of saving any time as too much info needed to be saved so we went with a save on level completion instead. There's a lot of game to like here. The four levels are big and should offer plenty of challenge to keep you going for quite a while. The graphics are a great combination of high res background and some superbly animated C64 sprite work and the look of each level is very different from the last. My only slight niggle is the music seems a little bit too sedate for this kind of adventure. Soul's tracks are good but not very memorable and there's not a single tune that I was humming after I turned off my C64. Still they are pretty atmospheric and I really did like the sound effects which complemented the action really well. This game is another gem in the Hakon 64's crown and the game is both NTSC and PAL compatible and works on everything from real hardware, virus and the C64 for Mini and Maxi. It's not only an excellent homage to that Palace Software classic, but takes all its shortcomings and makes a truly grand fun adventure game that any C64 owner should be happy with. Number 17 Iron Sword 2 was released in 2020 by Double Sided Games. It's a game in the genre that rarely gets any support in the modern era on the C64, namely the RPG. And this is a full on RPG, much in the vein of the classic Ultima games or early SSR titles of the era. Although this one has a twist, it really doesn't take itself too seriously, which makes it break out of the mold of most RPGs. The story involves you trying to track down the hot elf girl you met in the bar the previous night before getting so drunk and passing out. It's a traditional top-down RPG with all the tropes intact. The battles, however, are turn-based but are super fast, making it feel much more modern in that respect. The world is pretty big with 9 massive dungeons to explore and over 30 unique monsters to fight. Also the armor and weapons you find are randomly generated, much like the modern game Borderlands for example. This is a fun and very easy to pick up RPG with quirky modern humor that may not be for everyone and fast-paced battles. It's available in physical and and digital forms and the digital version comes with the original hired sword game as a bonus which you don't have to have played to enjoy this one. It's a great C64 variation on the classic RPG mechanics by double-sided games. Number 16
Luftrauser Z made its debut on the C64 in 2017 by programmer Paul Kohler and was released physically by RGCD. The shoot 'em up is based on the 2014 indie PC game Luftrauser and is a fast paced city of pans shoot 'em up arcade style action game where you take out hordes of fighter planes, massive battleships, and other ace pilots in over 60 different missions. The game features over 100 combinations of plane and weapon upgrades as you blast your way up the leaderboard to become the ultimate ace pilot. This is one of those new style C64 games that brings a modern look to the old bread box with its vibrant stylish reds, yellows and whites to make a C64 game that looks like no other. The game is extremely fast paced and it's gonna take a little bit of time to get used to but once you get the flow of it it's an amazing experience and has an absolutely loud rocking SID track to accompany the action. Just bear in mind this game is in PAL format only and does not run on NTSC system. But if you're playing it through emulation it should be no problem. So if you're looking for a unique modern style shoot 'em up on your C64 then look no further. Number 15 Barnsley Badger was designed by Trevor Story and released by Cytronic Software in 2016. Trevor Story has been a pretty prolific designer in the last few years on the Commodore 64, making a bunch of really brilliant games like Organism and The Legend of Atlantis, just to name a couple. This however is nothing like those and is a perfect almost companion piece to the Monty Legacy, or more specifically the third game, Monty on the Run. Barnsley, just like Monty, is a down on his luck dude, just looking to make a quick buck. He hears a story about buried treasure in his local graveyard, so being the vagabond he is, he goes to steal it before anyone else so he can pay off his ridiculous debts, or so the story goes. The first thing you'll notice is the Spectrum styled Monty graphics, which they have been able to replicate so well here, yeah, and I absolutely love it. Back in the day, I always scoffed at this style of graphics, but honestly, I quite like it now. It feels retro, but just in the right way. Collecting and dodging is the prime gameplay, just like in Monty, but the game is a lot more forgiving than that department, which makes the game more fun to play as a result. Trying to find all the treasures is an absolute blast. Collecting power-ups like the glowy stones, which you use in your slingshot, which is an absolutely awesome addition to the game. And just plain exploring the 120 screens this little beast has to offer is so much fun. In the digital download, you also are provided with a map of the whole game, so it gives you a nice idea of the scope of it and the lay of the land. The music by Andy Andrew Fisher is very cool as well. From the loading tune to the actual game, it's just great stuff. I also like the modern sensibilities, like the checkpoints scattered all over the place, indicated by these blue fire things that make traversing this place a lot more enjoyable. The level design is also well done, and each jump and platform seems to be set up really well to challenge and keep the pace going, and Barnsley moves a bit faster than Monty, so it's a bit of a quicker game, but still retains that Monty feel excellently. If you own a C64 and love platformers, then this is an awesome addition to your collection that is fun, charming, and just the right amount of difficult. So we're going to stop this countdown here for a few minutes and I'm going to go over to Retro Gamer Nation, my friend Louie, and he's going to give his top five favorite Commodore 64 modern era games. Thanks Brendan, and hi to all 64k viewers. My fifth favorite game for the past decade is Rocky Memphis and the Legend of Atlantis. I'm a sucker for arcade adventure games and this one I really enjoyed for its non-linear gameplay, clever and fair puzzles, and a dark mode setting that provides a nice twist to its style of play. All of this combines so well to produce a long, enduring and enjoyable game. Number 4 on my list is Steel Ranger by my favourite development team, Covert BitOps. Steel Ranger is a highly enjoyable experience that reminds us how good a 2D shooter platformer can be. High production values, large game world, absorbing gameplay and steady pacing make it a must play. What is the best puzzle game on the C64? It has to be my third choice, Millie and Molly. Engaging and always accessible puzzle level designs draw you into its cute game world that will have you playing through to all of its 100 levels. And how about that great implementation of the Rewind Move feature? Great job Carlton Hanley. I'm lucky enough to get invited to be a tester for quite a few modern day C64 games. I've never enjoyed myself more than when I got to test my second choice, The Isle of the Cursed Prophet. This great exploration style of game gradually unravels before you as you're constantly rewarded each time you find and pick up new items. Intuitive one button controls, great cinematic intro and ending screen, and a large game world are some of the reasons why I simply love this game. Mullets, heavy metal, first world conspiracies and a whole lot of blasting action. What is there not to love about my favourite C64 game from the past decade, MW Ultra. Great graphics and animation, atmospheric music soundtrack, expansive game world exploration, 
fun but challenging combat and immersive storytelling. MW Ultra has it all and needs to be experienced by everyone who enjoys SE64 gaming. And I just want to thank Louis again for sharing his top 5. Now, back to the countdown. Number 14. With such a massive library of games and game styles, the C64 never actually received a port of Bomberman, or many clones for that matter. A late 1992 C64 game release called Bug Bomber by Kingsoft was probably the closest the system ever got to a Bomberman style game, at least during the system's 1982 to 1993 original period. But that all changed in 2013 when Bomberland 64 was released by RGCD. This game is obviously a well crafted ode to Bomberman and not really the original but some of the more later ones in the series which added the elaborate multiplayer aspects and much more chaotic action. Gameplay is the same as I talked about earlier with the biggest difference being the pace and it being even more in the style of a foster paced arcade game. It still has all the wacky power ups like speed and bomb radius and a multitude of massive very cool boss battles as well. Being based on later Bomberman games means not only do you get an excellent 36 level single play experience with its full own story, but you also get all those fun multiplayer death matches from the more chaotic titles like Saturn Bomberman. The death matches also support 2 to 5 players with the help of Protovision's 4 player adapter that works with your original C64. It's always very cool to see such well implemented support for this peripheral. This game is excellent on all fronts, from its high res detailed graphics, awesome pumping Sid music, the excellent single and multiplayer options, and of course tight responsive controls. I think coder Mikhail Okawiki did a stellar job that was apparently 10 years in the making. This game is also free as a digital download from RGCD and I'll leave a link to their site. It's also available in this excellent physical version on cartridge with a ton of extras. Currently as of making this it's sold out but maybe some new stock will be produced. Overall even if you're not a fan of Bomberman's multiplayer aspects this version's single player experience is a great treat for anyone wanting a fun, easy to get into arcade romp. Number 13. The Age of Heroes was released in the first quarter of 2019 by Cytronic Software for the C64. With Akim Volkers on programming duties, Trevor Story on graphics and design, and Soul Cross on music and sound effects, you know this is going to be something special. The story is you have to gather a bunch of stones to get rid of some evil in the land. You know your usual fantasy nonsense backstory. It's pretty much on par with Rastan's throwaway plot. As you can probably see though, this game is very much inspired by Rastan, particularly the C64 version but oh does it do it a thousand times better. Just like the rest and arcade this is a scrolling hack and slash with the ability to pick up weapons and smart bombs and kill all manner of beasts and bosses. There are 15 levels to play through and you can access them from a map and tackle them in all different orders. Although your path will eventually be blocked if you haven't found the stones for completing the levels which gives you access to new areas. The best part about this game is that you can backtrack and replay any level again which really helps you upgrade your character. As a game employee some light RPG elements. The more beasts you kill, the stronger you get as you level up. So replaying older levels is key. Visually I think the stages are really varied and look really good. I love that they are not too long and don't overstay their welcome. Taking out the giant head bosses gives you access to better weapons like a giant axe or improved sword. There is a massive variety of monsters you can fight and each one can be taken out in different ways. The game feels really good and is not slow and clunky like the original C64 last hand, but moves briskly and handles quite well. There are also some really nice fantasy-esque tunes to be heard throughout the game. The game is also generally pretty easy which makes it way more accessible to the average gamer. Also make sure to check out the excellent music demo that's also included in the game. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Number 12. 
Sydney Hunter and the Sacred Tribe was released in 2018 on the Commodore 64 by Collectivision Games. The Sydney Hunter series has been around since about 2012 with various other retro versions being available before this C64 port. The game follows very closely in Montezuma Revenge's shoes as it's an open world platform adventure game where you play Sydney Hunter, an adventurer exploring the Yucatan Peninsula after treasure but gets caught by a local tribe and becomes their prisoner. Help them find their mystical portal and then you'll gain your freedom. As you can see gameplay is very much in Montezuma's mold where looting for treasure is used to give to the tribesmen to gain access to new areas. The temple is filled with traps and creatures that are intent with sending you to the grave which actually leads to one of the game's coolest moments as in the afterlife you meet Panama Joe and he ushers you back to the land of the living which is one of the best throwback cameos I've ever seen in a game. One of the most obvious drawbacks of the original version of Montezuma's was the lack of a map feature which is included in Sydney and makes exploring the hundred screen maze much easier to comprehend. There's all manner of traps from spark pits, lava, quicksand, bats, snakes etc. Although as a game Sydney is much easier and more forgiving to play with your character having nice big jumps that don't require painful pinpoint accuracy. I really also love the graphic style as it employs the C64's underused high res mode for really sharp and defined graphics and animation. The music is provided by Icon 64's regular Sid Master Soul Cross and is very reminiscent of his later tunes for them and is good without being overbearing. This is another one of those games that I stumbled across in about 2018 and literally reignited my love for the C64 once again and inevitably spawned this channel. So what more can I really say? about this other than it's a C64 game well worth tracking down to play. Number 11 Steel Ranger was released in 2018 by Cytronic Software and is another game by Lasse Orni whose previous title, Hessian, is another gem that will be covered on this channel at some point. Just like in the case of Manfred Trends, although this time it is completely programmed by one man himself, including the music, and is a real feat if you have to consider the quality and size of it. Just like Turrican, Steel Ranger is a run and gun platform exploration game, although there is a much bigger emphasis on story with light RPG elements as well as you can upgrade your suit and weaponry. The story is humanity has left earth and is attempting to find another planet to colonize but run into this machine race bent on human extinction. That's where you come in as your ship is sent to investigate a planet and crashes resulting in the start of your adventure. The action is a lot less hectic than Turrican with the exploration aspect much more prevalent. Tons of weapons and suit upgrades like being able to transform into the ball like Turrican and the ability to get jetpacks later on all add massive layers to an already dense gaming experience. There are no levels and the entire game is made up of six massive sections you can explore by unlocking certain areas to progress. Finding secret rooms, tons of variations on enemies to destroy, never mind all the epic boss encounters make this really stand out as a top quality C64 title on all levels. Graphics and music are quite excellent and it plays extremely well with its mixture of exploration and run and gun action. This game is also NTSC and PAL compatible and works perfectly on a C64 Mini as well. So head on over to Citronic and check it out for yourself. Okay, so let's stop this video again. I want to give a little bit of an honorable mentions list. These are C64 games that didn't quite make this list. They're all modern era stuff that are quite excellent. I put together a little sizzle reel kind of an arcade attract music video for you to check out.
Data Wing was released in September 2020 through ProtoVision. It's a fantastic vertical scrolling shoot 'em up on the Commodore 64 by Sarah Jane Avery, who gave us 2019's Neutron, which is basically the precursor to this great shooter. Check out my top 10 2019 release Commodore 64 games for more info on that one. This game is a throwback to old style arcade games from the 80s and early 90s, especially the arcade shooter Gemini Wing by Tecmo, which Sarah says was the inspiration for Zeta Wing. You can definitely see it in the creature and level design, and it's a great ode to that game, which incidentally, Sarah was also part of the same team in 1989 that converted Gemini Wing to the Amiga. And Back to Zeta, which has seven stages in total, with three difficulty settings, making it easy for people that find shoot 'em ups difficult to have a good time. The first thing I loved about this was the bouncy, fun music. It's instantly likable and brought a smile to my face, as it reminded me a lot of shooters like Fantasy Zone and Parodius. All the music, graphics, and programming were done by Sarah herself, making this game one of those classic one man or <laughs> one woman shows. The game flows extremely well, with a simple to understand weapons upgrade system and a player friendly way of dealing with hits. Meaning if you take a stray bullet you will only lose one level of your upgraded weapons so you never left stranded with zero upgrades on the hardest part of a level. The graphics are great with tons of awesome parallax scrolling and well animated enemies and bosses. I also love the variety in the levels, it's not just one of those kind of space shooters where it's the same scenery over and over again. Each level has its own look and cool tricky bosses to overcome. As a programmer you can definitely see where she got the skills to make such a fantastic shoot em up. The combination of the Gemini wing conversion, plus she also worked on two excellent core design shooters on the Mega CD slash Sega CD, namely the brilliant Soul Star and Thunderstrike. Overall I loved it, it plays really really well, it doesn't feel cheap, you always get a little bit further each time. The graphics and sound are both top notch quality. Also of special note, if you downloaded this game in the first day or two of release, just make sure you download the new version as of making this, as it adds a savable high score table to the game for some added replay value. The full soundtrack for the game has also been uploaded to YouTube by Sarah herself, and the game is available as a digital download for the C64 and works with original hardware, Mini, Maxi and Vice. All links are available in the video description. This is just a cool shooter done with a ton of passion for the genre. Check it out, it's well worth it. Number nine. Bruce Lee Return of Fury is the second fan-made Bruce Lee C64 game to be made and was released by Megastyle in 2019. Story-wise, this one is a direct sequel to the first, where the original wizard dude has rebuilt his castle and Bruce can't help but challenge him, as in the movie Game of Death. Yama and the Ninja make their return, and now all three can be human controlled with ProDivision's 4-player adapter, making this the ultimate Bruce Lee multiplayer experience. Gameplay-wise, because coder DMX, who did the sequel, used the original source code, this game feels exactly like the original with all its quirks intact and makes it feel a little bit more authentic than the previous game. Collecting lanterns, avoiding traps all make a return and the new screens are well implemented with really great well thought out level designs. Difficulty is probably on par with the original, meaning it's quite easy but a real fun experience. Graphics and sound are pretty much a carbon copy of the original, with the inclusion of an excellent title screen and brilliant load of music by Anders Rodal, who did the awesome load of music in Megastyle's Exploding Fish. I had so much fun with this new release and would highly recommend it to any classic fan of the original, and I think it stands alone as a really great game for newbies to the C64 as well. And here it is, my number one for 2020, which is The Shadow Over Hawksmill by Icon64 and distributed by Cytronic Software. This is Icon64's third appearance on this list and a much deserved entry as they deliver their best game of the year in my opinion. 
Hawksmill is an action puzzle adventure game inspired by the works of author H.P. Lovecraft, where your character heads off to a sleepy English village, Hawksmill, to investigate the disappearance of all the townsfolk. You've been studying the Necronomicon and believe the disappearances and the book are linked. This game follows on from the excellent Rocky Memphis game, with similar action puzzle and investigation stylings, and is dripping in excellent atmosphere with its awesome soundtrack, just driving home that sense of dread as he investigates the town. It's also really big with about 60 screens to go through as you start in the town square before descending deeper and deeper underground to the heart of the story. It's very well designed with simple controls and logical puzzles that make sense and quick fast action gameplay and manages to really suck you into the world as I couldn't stop playing it until I'd gone all the way. It's also got a really good intro like Archon's Isle of the Cursed Prophet which really sets the mood and story up well and is a graphic delight as is the game which was co by Stuart Collier of Sizzler and Legend of Atlantis fame, Trevor Story on graphics and design, and obviously Soul Cross with another great soundtrack that gels with the game so well. It also features one of those cool Archon 64 music demos where you can check out some music from some of their previous games as a bonus. The game is NTSC and PAL compatible and available in digital and physical form from Sartronic Software. And this is just a game I would not hesitate recommending to any C64 gamer as it's not only a great game for veterans, but also an easy game to get into for newbies to the C64 scene. Well done Icon64 and Sartronic Software for producing my personal favorite C64 game of 2020. So you would think that with over 20 different versions of this game existing, a Commodore 64 port would have happened. But no, it didn't. It took 22 years and an unofficial port for it finally to appear on the C64 in 2011. And boy was it worth the wait. The port was headed up by Andreas Varga, better known in the C64 community as Mr. Sid. He went back to the original Apple II source code to produce this fantastic version, which makes it very accurate to the original game. Besides programming, graphics and sound, Andreas also had help with graphics by Stephen Day, who also worked on the X excellent unofficial Donkey Kong Jr. conversion to the C64, which I covered in episode 6 of this show. Graphically, this game captures the look of the PC version very well, and all the animation and cutscenes are intact, and it has an excellent rendition of the PC music and good sound effects. It's quite an amazing feat, not only that, but all 13 levels are present, making it a 100% accurate port in terms of keeping all features and levels intact. It's still a damn tough game, but plays really well, with lots slow down in certain sections, but apart from that it's pretty brilliant. You can play it through emulation on BOSS or a C64 Mini, and the game is made possible to run on an original C64 as well as an Easy Flash cartridge, which holds more memory than a standard C64 allowing the game to run perfectly on the system. This is another excellent effort by Mr. Sid and crew, and still proves the old Bray Box has a lot of life still left in it, and we wouldn't have it any other way. Riley Witch Chronicles was released in the last quarter of 2021 by Witchsoft on the Commodore 64. This game is a full-on traditional JRPG on the C64, programmed, written and designed by Sarah Jane Avery of Soul Force fame. It's a big fun adventure, clocking in at between 15 and 30 hours depending on your skill level, so there's plenty of bang for your buck here. The game itself is based on Sarah's own Riley Witch Chronicles book series, and if you like old school traditional 80s style JRPGs, like the original Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, then this game is going to be right up your alley. The story involves Briley, a girl from Earth who gets sucked into another world of witches and magic. There she has to adapt quickly and learn the witching ways to basically survive and solve the mystery of the dark spirit who resides in the forest. This game covers the first four books in Sarah's series, with her saying herself, yes there will be a Briley 2 and a Briley 3, thinking of making an Amiga version of the whole series too. So the series is probably going to see the entire book series in game form which is quite amazing. The game itself is pure quality from top to bottom. Gameplay is slow but rewarding with lots of turn based combat and chatting with NPCs and obviously completing quests. The menus are layered with details from equipping items, mixing ingredients to make potions, exploring vast dungeons in towns. The best part of Bali for me is the writing though and how it actually manages to make every character unique and memorable which is quite a feat for 8-bit 
gaming. If you're not good at RPGs then fear not as well, as it has the option to play in normal or easy mode if you just want to follow the story and enjoy the overall experience. Music is also quite good, I did notice that some of the tracks are almost slowed down versions of some of the music from Soul Force, or at least that's what it sounds like to me. Still, awesome stuff nevertheless. I also love the easy to use save feature and the fact that you can actually play this keyboard style, which for me makes this game's pace and menu so much quicker and easier to navigate, and I'd highly recommend this over the joystick controls. It also features an excellent PDF manual which is loaded with information, and I'd definitely recommend you read this before starting up the game. It's both NTSC and PAL compatible, and works on the Mini and Maxi. This game is just plain excellent, great varied graphics, nice soundtrack, deep gameplay, great writing and solid game mechanics across the board. Just make it my personal favorite C64 game of 2021. Check it out. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Valencia was programmed by Jason Aldred and released for the Commodore 64 through Protovision Games in 2017. The game is a massive homage to the aforementioned Gallagher, and in many respects, in least my opinion, it's a better game than the original. Attention to detail is in high order, from the cool loading Sid music to the fun intro sequence that really sets the tone for this exceptionally well made game. The story is cheesy B-movie fun where we let the bee population of Earth almost completely die out and now the bee space guardians are here to attack Earth. Your character also gets to pilot the 1981 Galencia ship, which is an obvious reference to Galaga itself and its release date, and have to blast all the bugs and defend Earth from the bee domination. What I really like about this game, and you're probably going to hear me say this in the future episodes of the series but although the game is retro in love and the system it's on it still manages to feel like a modern game the ship feels very smooth the fire rate is a bit faster than Gallagher so you get to feel a lot more lethal and it pumps up the fun factor as the pace feels much quicker through the 50 levels a sucker has to offer there are also two types of bonus stages one being the traditional shoot the swarms without missing a shot kind of deal just like Gallagher but the second one has you flying through an asteroid belt just trying to survive all the while trying to pick up these strange stars which boost your score and in turn get you closer to those free lives. The music and sound effects are top notch as well and we have Pulsebot and Soul Cross to thank for that. The graphics are really nice too, detailed, colourful and you can see a lot of effort has gone into the smallest of details. And don't just take my word for it, even Julian Regnall from Zap64 gave it a sizzler so you know this thing is legit. This is just a fantastic game whether you play the awesome physical version from Protovision on a real C64, is both NTSC and PAL versions available by the way, or download it and play it through your VAS emulator, you're in for a damn good time. And here it is, La Vie de More, my favorite C64 game of 2019. And it's another game by Antonio Savona and Sol Cross, the guys responsible for those excellent C64 Activision conversions. This game just oozes quality from start to finish. It's not extremely long, but it's jammed with detail, which is something I prefer to an overlong slog just for the sake of making a longer game. In this excellent platform adventure game, you play a monk on the run from the Templars, who ends up at this haunted church. Gameplay is very similar to the classic Monty on the Run game, where you collect scrolls revealing more about the story as you try to find all the crosses in the church. With its high-res graphics and excellent haunting music from Soul Cross, it's a wonderful game that is really fun to play. And it's not super difficult either, but challenging enough to keep you coming back to see the entire game through. Double Sided Games also has a full physical release for this one, so the option to get that awesome edition is still available. This is a highly recommended game from me that all sees 
64 owner should give a try. It's just pure excellent stuff. MW Ultra or Metal Warrior Ultra by Cytronic Software is a side-scrolling action-adventure game distributed by Protovision in 2020. It is part of the Metal Warrior series that started on the C64 in 1999 with its first release as it was originally an Amiga game from 1994. But this game is a massive overhaul or update of that original C64 version. The story is your friend dies on an illegal job that you're trying to pull off which leads to a local metal band as well as your own cracked psyche as you try to solve all the conspiracies surrounding it. The game was made by Lasse Arne who made the excellent Steel Ranger and Hessian. The game features a massive futuristic open world to explore, full of puzzles and people to talk to, cinematic cutscenes, massive bosses, a huge assortment of weapons to buy, built-in save game slots, excellent music and sound effects, awesome graphics and animation and top-notch gameplay to make it quite a remarkable game. It took two years to put together with a completely new engine and is a huge upgrade from the original version in every sense almost to the point that it's a completely new game. If you got a chance to play Steel Ranger then you know the kind of coolness that Lasse can deliver and this does that in spades. The game is available from Protovision in physical and digital versions. It's a high quality action adventure game that mixes the best of the genre with some really excellent storytelling. It's just a must play game of 2020. Soul Force was released by Protovision on the last day of 2020. It's the third game in a trilogy of shoot 'em ups that programmer Sarah Jane Avery has delivered to the C64 in the last two years. Unlike her other two entries which were vertically scrolling affairs, this is a horizontal entry with enough blasting action to make Manford trends blush. The story of the game is your part of the galaxy is getting invaded by a biomechanical invasion force and it's up to you and the Soul Force space fighter to destroy the threat once and for all. Just like Sarah's other two brilliant shooters, this C64 gem is loaded with modern gaming features which feels like a nice fit on the C64. We got plenty of options like four different difficulty settings, a password system to access levels that you've completed, and a built-in save game system, an auto fire option, and the game works on NTSC and PAL systems. But my favorite of all the options is being able to listen to any of the game's music tracks which is a cool console style feature. Now onto the game itself which includes 20 massive stages jam-packed with space, underwater, forests and alien bases, and tons of crazy bosses and mid-bosses to defeat. The levels are jam-packed with parallax scrolling and the stages get more and more crazy the further you go. I love the inclusion of the intermission screens between levels, it adds a lot of atmosphere, and the story elements between you and the main commander. It's this kind of fun stuff that makes this game stand above the rest. And what's a shooter like this without some great weapons? There are four types of pickups, and you can upgrade those to make them way more powerful. Lasers, triple shots, as well as click bombs to blow up everything on screen. Also like Sarah's excellent recent Zeta Wing game, if you die you only lose one level of your weapon power, so none of that annoying you lose everything effect that so many of these games on the C64 employed. You can also pick up a shield that can take a good number of hits, and this makes the game way more accessible to people that are not skilled in this genre. I had an absolute blast playing this game. I feel it just gets better and better the further you get. The later levels literally throw everything at you and it's a real rush and has a classic feel of a really good retro arcade game. The graphics are very good, the parallax scrolling on some of the stages are just excellent and the sheer variety of enemies and bosses is absolutely crazy. I love the small graphical touches like the jellyfish that split into two smaller versions when shot or the massive missiles that when hit drop to the surface and explode. The music is also fantastic. The amount of tracks packed in here is amazing. The best part is the overall Soul Force theme is carried over into a lot of the tracks which makes it feel like a really good classic movie soundtrack which tars all the music together and I really love all those fast paced boss tracks there's some real toe tappers in there the game is available in both physical cartridge version and digital form and if you got a digital copy and want to pimp it out check out the cracking group Access's new tool to convert your version into a crazy trained version with every cheat imaginable to help you if you're still finding the game too hard I'll leave a link in the description to the protovision website and this tool. This game is a brilliant shoot 'em up, jam packed with content and is truly a huge game with some of the best vertical scrolling action the C64 has to offer and stands tall with Sarah's Neutron and Zeta Wing as another classic addition to the C64's shoot 'em up. Three, 
interrupt our program to bring you this important message. And now let's have a look at my favorite C64 game of the past decade. And number one is... 2017 was an excellent year for C64 releases, but I don't think anyone could have predicted that Sam's Journey would be such a powerhouse of a platform release, rivaling the almost untouchable Mayhem in Monsterland for the C64 platforming crown. Sam's Journey was released through Protovision and created by the guys at Knights of Bats, whose past projects, Us Guys and Metal Dust, were both released through Protovision on the C64 as well. Knights of Bats were formed in the 90s by Chester Colson, where they released a bunch of late 90s to mid 2000s C64 releases. Their last Commodore game was Metal Dust in 2005, before they moved on to modern systems under a different name. In 2015, however, Chester revived the old label and production of Sam's Journey began. Just seeing that colorful, vibrant title screen, you know you're in for a top quality production. The game is made up of 27 levels with multiple overhead maps as well, giving you that almost Super Mario World vibe. This game, like Monster Land, just grabs you right from the start with its beautiful, colorful sprite-based graphics and smooth scrolling effects, and the music is fun and jolly in the best sense. As per usual with these games, collecting diamonds, finding secrets, jumping or just plain avoiding platform-related death is all part of the fun. The game also employs the costume mechanic. It's not new and has been done many times before like Sega's Kid Chameleon, but it does it very well and each of the six costumes bestows a new skill for Sam. Some of them like the pirate costume gives you a sword for dispatching enemies, or the ninja costume gives you the ability to jump up to impossible to reach areas, or the Dracula costume turning you into a bat. It's all extremely fun and adds so much replayability to each area. You're gonna die a lot. But I like the fact that the game starts you almost where you died, so it's never this long, tedious sequence of redoing half a level again. It's a great modern touch in a retro game. It's also C64 mini compatible, and the jump is already mapped to the fire button for the system, making it very easy for younger players to get into it who aren't used to pushing up to jump. Overall though, Sam's Journey is a massive, beautiful game, and injects so much life into the C64, it almost feels like I'm playing it on a new system. So that's it, that's my top 20 modern C64 games. And remember, just keep looking out for this logo for more celebrations of the C64's 40th anniversary. And thanks for joining me, Bastish B at 64K. I hope you had a good time. And if you can please like and subscribe, that'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.